In the last lecture, uh, we discussed uh, three modes of heat transfer, like conduction, convection, and uh, radiation. And the thermal conduction can be described by this uh, Fourier law, by right? namely the heat flux Q is equal to negative K dt dx. K is a thermal conductivity, right? dt dx is a temperature gradient. We also introduced a specific heat for a specific material. Right? That's the amount of heat needed to increase the temperature of one kilogram mass by one degree C. Right? That's the definition of a specific heat. And the thermal conduction right, is a analogous to electrical conduction. For example, Temperature is uh, analogous to voltage. Thermal conductivity is uh, analogous to electrical conductivity sigma. The heat flux Q right, is uh, analogous to uh, the charge flux or current density J. But then we also have the Ohm's law for thermal conduction, right, dQ dt, uh, which is a thermal current is equal to T1 minus T2 divided by RF, which is a thermal resistance. Right? So this is a Ohm's law for thermal conduction. We use a Ohm's law developed for electrical conduction to describe thermal conduction. And the thermal resistance RF is equal to L over Ka, where L is a this length, K is a thermal conductivity, A is a uh, cross sectional area. But this, uh, we can see this uh, definition is uh, very similar to electrical resistance, where R is equal to L over sigma A. We simply replace uh, this electrical conductivity with the thermal conductivity. Then we end up with the thermal resistance. But similarly, we can introduce the heat capacitance. C sub F, which is equal to MC, where M is a mass, C is a specific heat. Define, define that in the slide. And the convection refers to the heat transfer by the movement of liquid or gas. And the third mode, radiation, refers to the heat transfer by the emission of electromagnetic waves. It's also called black body radiation. And we have this uh, wind displacement law, right, which gives the frequency of wavelengths at which the black body radiation has a maximum specific intensity. Right? Lambda max is equal to uh, 289 Eight divided by uh, temperature in Kelvin. And uh, for human body, lambda max is about 10 micrometer, uh, which is in the, uh, which is a infrared radiation. So actually uh, the human body emits infrared. Now let's uh, discuss the uh, self-heating of a suspended resistor. But please note that a resistor is probably the simplest device in electrical circuits. However, when considering all the factors that affect its resistance, the resistor can be a very complicated device. For example, this is a suspended resistor could be fairly complicated. So now let's consider such a suspended polysilicon resistor. Right, previously, we learned how to fabricate a polysilicon resistor using technology such as a, a surface micro machine. When the current is applied, Due heat is generated in the resistor. 
right? Because uh, the heat is uh, equal to uh, I square R, right? That's the power uh, generated by the current. Then the temperature mass increase, right? Assume this is a suspended uh, part of silicon resistor, right? The temperature mass increase and the heat flows to the substrate through the two ends of the polysilicon resistor. The heat will be dissipated right, through the uh, two ends of the polysilicon resistor. Now our question is, uh, what's the temperature distribution on the resistor? Right, the temperature will increase. So we want to find the temperature distribution and we can uh, expect that the temperature distribution is not constant. It will be a function of the position X. Right, the horizontal position. The origin is uh, selected at the center of this uh, particle resistor. The total length is L. And we assume that the thermal conductivity K and electrical resistivity rho are constant. They do not change with the temperature. And practically, they also change with the temperature. Then the analysis becomes uh, very, very complicated. Right? So we need to you know, assume uh, both of uh, them are constant. And the neglect heat loss due to convection and the radiation. Right? We only consider the thermal conduction. And the substrate is a heat sink and it has a constant temperature of T zero. So the substrate has a temperature of T zero and it's considered as a heat sink whose temperature is a constant, does not change. But then we can consider a you know, small differential volume of the polysilicon resistor. And based on the energy conservation of this different volume, we can write this uh, equation. Right? This is an equation that based on energy conservation. Right? The left side, A times the delta X, right? delta X, the distance or length of this different volume. Right? A times the delta X, that's a volume, times the rho, times the C, specific heat, um, partial derivative of uh, temperature T with respect to time T. Right, this represents the internal energy increase rate. But right, this is equal to Q dot X is a heat flux flow into, or the, the thermal current flow into this uh, different value. And this is Q dot X plus that X. It's uh, uh, the it's, uh, thermal current flow out of this uh, different volume. And the plus G times the volume, right? A times the delta X, the volume. And G is uh, the heat generation rate in unit volume, right? If G times the total volume, that's simply the heat generated, right? the total heat generated inside this uh, different volume, right? So this is a energy conservation equation. And then we can solve this uh, differential equation. I will skip the, the details. And uh, this is a solution. I right? know that actually we only consider the steady state solution, right? So we, we don't worry about uh, the temperature distribution as a function of time. We only consider T as a function of X, right? X is just a horizontal position. And the Tx is equal to T zero, right? That's the substrate temperature plus I square, right? I is the current, L is the length, rho E is a re resistivity, right? Eight K, right? thermal conductivity, A square, right? A is a cross-sectional area. One minus X over L over two squared. So Tx is a function, the temperature is a distribution, the function of uh, X. And we can see that this is a, uh, a 
parabolic function of of x. That's a l over two. There's a negative a l over two. And then we can say that t x by reaches reaches uh, is the maximum value when x is uh, equal to zero, right? Namely, at the at the middle of the bridge, my right? center of the bridge. So the maximum time to increase delta t m is uh, at the middle of the bridge, namely when x is equal to zero, right? When x equal to a over two or negative a over two. By t is equal to t zero, right? so it's equal to the heat sink temperature. Right, that's uh, actually what we expected. Delta t m, right, the maximum temperature increase is equal to right from this uh, equation. We can see we just uh, make x equal to zero. Then delta t m is uh, i square l square rho e over eight k a squared. And uh, it can be rewritten as I squared times uh, rho E L over A times uh, L over 8 K A. And uh, rho E times L over A is what? It's an uh, electrical resistance, right? So I square R, why right? this is a I square R, right? this is the first term, I square R is a total joule power generated, right? which is a thermal current. Where the second term, right? L over 8 Ka must be the effective thermal resistance. So this, this equation is simply the Ohm's law for thermal conduction, right? Temperature delta T, right? Temperature change is equal to thermal current, ITH, times thermal resistance, right? That's Ohm's law for thermal conduction. Now we can also assume the thermal capacitance is mc, the mass times specific heat. Then the thermal time constant, tau, is simply equal to rc, right? same as uh, the rc time constant for electrical circuit. Here, r is the thermal resistance, c is the thermal capacitance. Right? The thermal resistance is L over 8 Ka, right? we derived here, and the capacitance is mc. Right? So this is a, thermal time constant of the of this uh, suspended polysilicon bridge. Right, this is a thermal time constant uh, tells you how fast uh, this uh, uh, bridge can, uh, uh, the temperature of this bridge can increase or decrease. Right, if it has a large thermal constant, why right, it would take, take long time to uh, change its temperature. Right, we can say tau is a proportion to uh, its mass, proportion to uh, L, inversely proportional to the you know, cross-sectional area. Oh, by the way, here it's a uh, I just said it's a proportion uh, inversely proportional to the cross sectional area. This is uh, actually not a very accurate. Okay, let's do a, a little bit more analysis here, because m m is equal to what mass mass is equal to delta t right? This is low density. Uh, let's see this, uh, I already have a row here. This uh, row, yeah, this is density. Oh, okay, right here, and I, I, I wrote here. It's density times LA, right, times volume. M is uh, LA times uh, row. So A can be canceled, 
you see this tile is independent of the cross sectional area, but proportional to L squared. So this is a, this is a time constant, a thermal time constant of a suspended resistor with a length L. Questions? A self-heated resistor has many applications. One example is a, is this a hydrogen sensor. But this hydrogen sensor right, consists of a suspended polysilicon resistor with a thin layer of platinum on top. But this is a cross-sectional view of this hydrogen sensor. We have suspended a polysilicon resistor, an insulator, and a platinum thin film is coated above this uh, polysilicon resistor. Right, this is a SEN image of two suspended polysilicon resistor, 200 micron long. When heated to an appropriate temperature right, by applying a uh, current, electrical current, platinum, right, the platinum on the top, promotes the oxidation of combustible gases, such as hydrogen or methane. Right? So this type of sensor can detect hydrogen and the methane as well, or other combustible gases. The additional heat released by the oxidation reaction, right, the oxidation of hydrogen or methane, can be detected by the polysilicon resistor. So here, the suspended polysilicon resistor plays two roles. First, the heater right, to increase the temperature because the oxidation only occurs at the elevated temperature. Right? So we need to uh, raise the temperature. Right? That's the first function. Second, this polysilicon resistor also serve as a detector, uh, which detects the temperature change by the additional heat released by the oxidation leads to the temperature change of the polysilicon resistor. Right? So it serves a heater and a temperature sensor. Uh, this uh, uh, figure shows the center response when it's subjected to uh, uh, various concentration of hydrogen by 1.6%, 1 1%, 0.5%, 0.1%, and that's the standard response. So there's a one application of uh, self-heated uh, polysilicon resistor. And this is another application of a suspended resistor, hot wire anemometer, hot wire anemometer. A hot wire anemometer is a device for measurement of airflow velocity, velocity fluctuation, and the sometimes flow direction. Right, so it's type type of flow sensor. Right, it detects flows, and it's based on hot wire principle. Or we can use a suspended, self heated polysilicon resistor to measure the airflow, right, to function as a hot wire anemometer. This is the SEN image of a 70 micron long polysilicon resistor, right, which serves as a hot wire anemometer. And as Suspended polysilicon resistor, which is heated by passing an electric current, can be used as a, a hot wire anemometer. When this heated polysilicon resistor is exposed to a gas flow, the heated wire loses the heat to the flow by convection, right? It's based on thermal convection. The flow will 
um, remove heat from the heated wire. But then it's electrical parameter, right? Such as a uh, voltage or current or resistance will change accordingly. It right? will be a function of the flow, right? So the velocity of the flow is then correlated to the measurement results of those parameters, right? Voltage, current, resistance. So that's the operating principle of uh, uh, hot wire anemometer based on a self-heated polysilicon resistor. Another widely used thermal structure in MEMS is a micro hot plate. A micro hot plate can have a larger heated area than the bridge structure where right? we just discussed uh, the suspended uh, partisan bridge. Right now we are going to discuss another type of thermal structure, micro hot plate. A micro hot plate right, consists of a suspended plate supported by one beam or multiple beams. Right? In this figure, well, for simplicity, this is uh, a mm, Hot plate is supported by a single beam, but it could be multiple beams. And there is a resistor R integrated on the on the plate, right? R. Right, this R serves as a heater. So the heater. And assume the temperature of the substrate is a T0, right? The heat sink has a temperature of T0. T0, T0, right, this is a cross-sectional view. And uh, when temperature is, uh, when time, at time zero, the place, right, this uh, place temperature is also T0, right, so they are in thermal equilibrium, right, they are both uh, at uh, T0. Now assume the temperature of the plate is a uniform, right? To simplify the discussion, we assume this plate has a uniform temperature, right? And then we apply a current I to the heater right, at time zero. What do we have? Right? Then we can expect that the temperature of this uh, micro hot plate will increase, and then Thermal conduction occurs, right? There is a temperature gradient. So heat will flow from the micro plate to the heat sink through this beam, right? So this is the energy conservation equation. Right? I squared R, that's a total heat generated, is equal to internal energy increase rate of the plate. Right, its temperature increases. So it's a MC, right, the thermal capacitance times uh, DT over uh, D, uh, temp, uh, D uh, time, right, rate. And the KWH, T minus T0 over L, that's the heat dissipated through the beam. The thermal current flows through the beam. That can be calculated based on Ohm's law, right? T minus T zero, right? That's a T, temperature of the plate, right? That's uh, equal to voltage difference divided by thermal resistance, right? So L over KWH, that's uh, thermal resistance. So R, RTH is uh, equal to L by right, the length over thermal conductivity divided by WH, the cross-sectional area, right? That's the thermal resistance. So this is a, a, the thermal current. By the solution, by this is the solution of this differential equation. Right? T is equal to T0, right? T0 is the heat sink temperature. 
I square RL times the K uh, divided by KWH minus by this times the exponential to the power of negative KWH over MCL times T. So T is a function of time. And then if we plot this T as a function of time, this time zero, well, you have this kind of shape. When t goes to infinity, right? When t goes to infinity, t is equal to t zero plus i square r l over k w h. This is actually based on can be calculated based on this Ohm's law, right? For steady state, the first term is a zero. Right? Dt over dt is a zero. Right? So we can calculate the steady state temperature uh, based on this equation. Right? And then when t is a zero, we, we can verify this result you know, with a t of zero and t of infinity. When t is zero, this is equal to one, right? So this two, right, the second and the third term cancel with each other, t is similarly equal to t zero, right? So that's, uh, that's uh, no, what we expect. And this one, the coefficient in front of t is a uh, one over tau, right? So the time constant, time constant tau is the reciprocal of this, right? The reciprocal of the coefficient, mcl over kwh. So tau is the l over kwh times mc, right? L over kwh, that's a thermal resistance. MC is thermal capacitance. Right. So as we actually verify that uh, the thermal time constant is uh, simply equal to RC. Right. Thermal resistance times the thermal capacitance. Questions? And this is an application of micro hot plate. And this is a metal oxide gas sensor. This is a SEM image of a micro hot plate with a dimension of a 128 micron by 128 micron. Right, so the dimension. But this uh, uh, hot plate is a suspended by four beams, right? There are four beams here. And please know that this uh, uh, mic hot plate is uh, suspended. Right? This is a fabricate, you can, uh, you can guess that it's uh, fabricated using my like, surface of micro machining. And this is a cross sectional view. This uh, uh, mic hot plate, a metal oxide layer right? is a fabricated uh, on the top of this uh, mic hot plate. And a part silicon heater and the temperature sensor are also integrated. And this uh, uh, hot plate is uh, suspended in order to achieve a good thermal isolation, right? It's thermally isolated. When the metal oxide is heated and the gas to be measured interacts with it, right? so the heated metal oxide can interact with uh, the target gas. Then its resistance will change, right? The resistance of the metal oxide will change, right? So we can measure the gas by monitoring the resistance change of the metal oxide, right? So this is the operating principle of the metal oxide gas sensor. One of the most frequently used metal oxide is a tin oxide, like SNO2. MEMS technology is a excellent for this type of sensor since micro thermal isolation structures, such as a micro hot plate, can be easily fabricated. 
right? For example, using surface micro machining. Or we can also use a bulk micro machining. Next, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of uncooled infrared sensors. Infrared detectors or sensors are very important in both military and civilian applications and have been extensively investigated over the past century. Commercial applications of IR focal plane arrays, or sensor arrays, could cover medicine, fire control, surveillance, and the driver's vision enhancement. But the military, military application could include night vision, rifle sight, surveillance, missile guidance, tracking, and interceptors. As we mentioned, as mentioned in the uh, previous slide, human being actually emits infrared. Right. Human body is a source of infrared. And uh, we know that infrared can penetrate concrete, wood materials, plastics, fabrics, and so on. Right. It can penetrate many materials, right? especially uh, insulating materials. Therefore, infrared is an excellent method to detect human being, right, to detect human, especially in the night, right, even in the absolutely dark night, we still can detect human by infrared, right, because a human is a source of infrared, right, human body constantly emits infrared. So infrared plays very important roles in security, surveillance, and uh, many military applications. I have an, a very interesting question here for you. How can we prevent ourselves from being detected by infrared sensor? Any idea? We know that we constantly emit infrared radiation. So how can we prevent ourselves from being seen by infrared detectors? Perhaps infrared if you had a, um, a material which would, um, which has a... Very good, I, I guess you... Gap that's smaller that wouldn't allow uh, infrared uh, light to pass through or the other thing penetrate it. Excellent, excellent. So we actually can use a, a thin metal foil to block infrared radiation, right? That's actually uh, what exactly uh, people are doing right now, right? They can integrate some uh, thin metal foil above the clothes, or they make some aprons based on you no know, metal foil. And we know infrared cannot penetrate metals. Excellent answer. Now let's take a look at the optical spectrum. We actually discussed this previously. So let's uh, just have a you know, brief recap. But this figure shows the visible and the infrared regions of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, right? It's a very small region, small uh, portion of uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And the visible light, right? Visible light ranges from uh, 0.4 to 0.8 microns, micrometer. So simply speaking, like infrared is a electromagnetic radiation with longer wavelengths 
than those of visible light, right? greater than 0.8 micron. The infrared spectrum can be divided into short wave infrared, right? one to three micron, mid wavelength infrared, three to five micron, long wavelength infrared, eight to 12 micron, and the very long wavelengths infrared, right? greater than 12 micron. By some fundamental concepts, the energy of electromagnetic uh, wave E is equal to H nu. Right? H is a Planck's constant, this nu is a frequency. But alternatively, the energy can be calculated using uh, wavelengths, lambda. But the energy will be equal to 1.24 divided by lambda, by lambda in micrometer. Then the the unit for the energy is EV. And then from black body radiation, uh, we know that lambda max, uh, that's a wings displacement law. Right? The wavelengths at which the black body radiation is a maximum right? is equal to 2,898 divided by temperature T. And the human body, right? Uh, image uh, infrared radiation with a lambda max at uh, around 10 micrometers, right? because T for human body is about uh, 300 K. So somewhere between nine to 10 micrometers. Right? That's the reason we can use a you know, infrared detector to detect uh, human. There are two types of infrared sensors. In general, the infrared uh, detector can be classified as a, either photon detector or thermal detector. In the first category, photon interact directly with the charge carriers in a semiconductor to generate a photo current. And the photo detector by right, the first category are usually operating at a low temperature, which require cooling. But the operating principle of the first category is uh, illustrated in this figure. But this is a semiconductor material. EG is a uh, you know, energy band gap. The bottom is a valence band, uh, top is a conduction band. The incident infrared photon, by right, incident uh, infrared radiation, can be observed by the semiconductor, right? And then the electrons in valence band are excited to the conduction band, generating photon current, right? So the infrared radiation can be detected by measuring the photon current. And in order to effectively absorb infrared, the energy of infrared must be larger than the energy band gap, right? Namely, H nu must be greater than EG, or EG must be less than H nu. For example, if lambda, lambda is 10 micrometer, and the energy of the infrared is uh, how large? Based on this formula, the 0.124 EV, right? So the semiconductor, the band gap of semiconductor must be less than 0.124 EV. Right, does this make sense? And at the room temperature, electrons also have the thermal energy. The thermal energy is equal to KT, by right? K is the Boltzmann constant, by right? T is the absolute temperature. And at the room temperature, how large is the thermal energy KT? Anybody remember? The thermal energy
0.026 EV, right? So we can see that this band gap is comparable to the thermal energy. So the electrons, the electrons, right? There are a lot of ele electrons in the conduction in the valence band. And those electrons can be excited to conduction band by the thermal energy. And the, that will lead to a current as well. That's a noise. And if the infrared radiation is weak, the signal can be overwhelmed by the noise current, right? The noise current can be much larger than the signal current. By this noise, almost specifically, we call the thermal noise. How can we reduce this thermal noise? Any, any suggestion? How can we reduce this thermal noise? Based on this uh, expression, my right, thermal energy equal to kT, k is the Boltzmann constant, uh, which we, we cannot change. So we can change what? The temperature T, but we can decrease the temperature T to decrease the thermal energy and decrease the thermal noise. That's why this type of sensor needs a cooling, right? Needs cooling, right? Photon detectors are usually operating at a low temperature, which requires cooling, right? That's the reason, right? Because we want to reduce the thermal noise. And this cooling can be achieved using liquid nitrogen or thermal electrical cooler. In the old days, right, uh, it's typically uh, based on uh, liquid nitrogen, but now um, there's a trend to switch to thermal electric cooler. Right, the thermal electric cooler is based on feedback effect or thermal electric effect. We also um, uh, briefly mentioned that. Any question? And the second category, oh, by the way, okay, uh, here. Uh, current cooled infrared sensor, the first category. Cooled infrared sensor system use a material system such as a mercury, cadmium, telluride. This is a indium antimonide, uh, platinum, silicon, and uh, Dope the silicon. And uh, you can uh, expect that this uh, semiconductor system must have an EG, uh, very small, which is very small. Okay, much smaller than uh, uh, the EG of silicon. The second category is characterized by the changes in certain properties of a material due to the change of temperature arising from absorption of the infrared radiation. The operating principle of the sediment category can be explained using this, uh, this figure, uh, very simple. This type of uh, infrared sensor does not need cooling. It's based on a thermally isolated plate for example, the microplate that we just mentioned. The incident infrared radiation will increase the temperature of the plate by right, based on the based on the energy conservation, right? If those uh, radiation is absorbed by this uh, plate, right, the temperature of the plate must increase. So the basic structure is a thermally isolated plate with integrated temperature sensor. 
what we call this uh, type of uh, infra sensor, uncooled infra sensor. It does not need cooling. So now the question is that how to detect the temperature change, right? The radiation, infrared radiation is detected by measuring the temperature change of this uh, thermally isolated plate. And previously, we have uh, already introduced a number of uh, different methods to measure temperature. But for example, well, we can use a thermally sensitive resistor or semester to uh, measure the temperature change. Uh, this slide shows an uh, uncooled infrared, de infrared detector array uh, developed developed by Honeywell, a very famous company. Right, semesters are used as a uh, temperature sensor right, to detect the temperature change. Right, specifically, it's made from vanadium oxide, whose TCR is 2% per degree C, right, very large TCR. And the thermally isolated structure is a, a suspended silicon nitride plate. There's a top side view, there's a cross-sectional view. But this uh, silicon nitride plate is uh, supported by two cantilever beams. So it's uh, thermally isolated. And uh, the instant infrared radiation increases the temperature of this plate, which is uh, subsequently detected by the semester. Vanadium oxide semester. So that's the operating principle of uh, like this type of infra infrared sensor. The temperature change can also be detected using pyroelectric detector. Please know that pyro, like pyroelectric effect, refers to the electricity generation by temperature change. Namely, delta T, right? pyro represents the uh, heat. Right? Delta T, temperature change leads to uh, voltage generation. Pyroelectricity is a migration of positive and negative charge, and therefore establishment of electrical polarization by P to up the end of a crystal's polar axis as a result of a change in temperature. Right? That T leads to voltage generation. Looking at it another way, right? pyroelectricity can be considered as piezoelectricity. Well, the string is caused by thermal expansion. So pyroelectricity is very similar to piezoelectricity. And we can use uh, this equation to describe pyroelectric effect. Uh, delta Q over A is equal to P times delta T, right? Delta T is a temperature change. Delta Q is a charge generated on the surface, right? The surface area is A. P is uh, the pyroelectric coefficient. So this equation gives us uh, delta Q over A, or the charge density, a right? surface charge density. How do we convert the surface, the charge to voltage? Well, we have done this for a piezoelectric detector, right? Voltage is equal to delta Q over capacitance, right? So we divide the Q by capacitance, then we will get the voltage. And please know that the pyroelectric detector 
it can be modeled as a capacitor in parallel with a resistor. And the charge, the charge generated on the surface, right, on the two surfaces, can leak through this resistor. Therefore, the pyroelectric detector does not have DC response. No DC response. But similarly, you can expect that uh, the piezoelectric detector does not have DC response either. Therefore, as shown in this figure, the voltage generated by the temperature change, right, if there's sudden uh, temperature change, right, step uh, function of temperature, the generated voltage right, due to this uh, pyroelectric effect will decay over time by right, no DC response. So pyroelectric detector is only used to detect dynamic temperature change or dynamic infrared signals. And pretty know that a well, semester can detect both static and the dynamic temperature changes. So that's a, that's a difference. We can also use a thermal piles to detect the temperature change. We can integrate thermal piles on the thermally isolated plate. Please know that thermal piles are simply multiple thermal couples. Right? This is equal to multiple. thermal couples. Wait, how do I, just a moment. Okay, the thermal couple actually is a, a typo here. Thermal couple. It could be one word, right? Thermal couples. Thermal power is simply multiple thermal couples connected in series. Right? If uh, there are n thermal couples connected together, the upper voltage, right, V of thermal power will be equal to n times uh, delta V, where delta V is the voltage generated by a single thermal couple. So we can see that we can increase the sensitivity significantly using thermal pile. Well, this is a, a 3D schematic of the infrared detector based on thermal piles. The hot ends of the thermal couples are placed at the center of the diaphragm. Uh, this is a this is a three D uh, view and this is a cross section view. Right, cold ends of the thermal couples are placed on the substrate, and from this uh, cross section view, right, we can see that an infrared absorbing layer is uh, coated on the diaphragm. Right, this uh, this uh, material helps to uh, uh, absorb infrared more effectively. Right. Then the, when there's the infrared radiation, right, the temperature of the diaphragm increases. And the temperature increase is detected by the thermal pile. Right, so this is the operating principle of this 
infrared uh, detector. But this figure shows a uh, 1024 element book micro machined thermal pile infrared imaging array. A fairly impressive work. So we can say that NEMS is an excellent technology to fabricate infrared sensor arrays. Uh, 